thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Mona Vernon. I work here um, at Thomson Reuters and I run and building a data innovation lab here. Um, and this is really exciting. It's our largest crowd yet. This event is called the Knowledge Worker Innovation Series. The idea around it was really to bring together a community in the innovation district of innovators, entrepreneurs, um, people that really want to celebrate innovation. And our focus really is on how knowledge work is changing. And so most of our recent events have been exploring the implications of big data. It is my pleasure to introduce Ben Fry. Uh, ben has been named one of the fast company's most creative people in business. He's a principal at Fathom, a Boston-based consultancy. And uh, Ben is, and his team have done some amazing data visualization project uh, all the way from illustrations in the New York Times, The Guardian, to software tool for geneticists, to interactive applications for clients like GE, Nike, Fidelity, The Knight Foundation, and also Thomson Reuters. Um, Ben is going to share with you some of uh, his work, and, and I would like you to uh, join us, join me in welcoming Ben Fry. Um, so I'm Ben Fry, I run a, a small studio over, the, at, uh, over in Beacon Hill uh, called Fathom Information Design. Um, we're about uh, 10 people, uh, one of whom is actually here. Uh, and the, uh, he's over there. Um, the thing that we're looking at is basically uh, we're essentially a design firm, but every, all of the work that we do is uh, grounded within data. So uh, everything that we, uh, all projects that we start with um, have to do with, uh, it's going to be code, it's going to be data driven, um, and basically how do we uh, really try and understand uh, different kinds of data, whether for, uh, for tools or for communications or you know, some of the other things that uh, Mona was just describing in the uh, introduction there. Uh, as mentioned, this is you know this will be about 30 minutes, so I'll uh, try and just get through a couple of projects and try and give you a sense of uh, the way that we approach problems and some of the things that we've worked on, uh, and then we can all sort it out in the uh, the Q and A that follows. Um, you know, at, at its most basic, often we're starting with something like this. You know, so there's uh, this goes on for uh, tens of thousands of rows, which is uh, fascinating. Uh, fundamentally, it's a um, set of uh, population data. So here, this is uh, how you typically show uh, populations uh, over time uh, in different age groupings, so trying to understand how many people are within these different age buckets. Um, oldest is at the top, youngest is at the bottom, and then male and female extend out from the middle. And we were asked to, and this is very typical across um, you know, uh, different projects like this. We were asked, though, to uh, try and take um, this, this story about essentially uh, Japan and their aging population. Um, they have this large cohort of people who are uh, in their 60s. And over the next uh, few years, what, you know, what's that going to mean as far as uh, the impact of uh, that group growing older uh, and the impact of that on the uh, healthcare industry, on uh, the economy, and so on? And so can we actually take that population data and start uh, telling that story for people. Um, so as a very simple example, what we've done here is uh, just taken that population plot and rotated it on its side. Um, typically, you know, reading left to right uh, is a little bit easier as far as how people actually understand time if you're not a, uh, an economist who's used to looking at population charts. Um, and at its most basic, we just have, you know, it's a set of um, bar charts. So uh, Japan here, here's the uh, men age 60 to 64. Uh, women in the same group. Uh, we have a, a second country, in this case, we have uh, United States selected down at the bottom. Uh, and we can get a little bit of a, a comparison between the two. So this is what the picture looks like for the UK, for Germany, for Italy. Um, and these are very simple you know, um, ways of actually interacting with this data. With the Japan story, what we want to do is be able to uh, run this forward. So uh, this was 2010. Uh, so what happens if we uh, move uh, 10 years into the future, we're looking at population estimates that came from the UN, uh, and we can see how this plays out over the next uh, 10 and 20 years and how that cohort, uh, that group of people who are in the 60 to 65 range move on to 65 to 70 and so on. Um, you know, so we can play this forward to 2050 or uh, start all the way back at 1950 and uh, run through the whole you know, 100 year span. Um, but very simply, this is, you know, uh, this is not a rocket science sort of approach to 
how to understand this data. This is um, uh, tens of thousands of data points uh, that are actually involved. This is over you know, 100 different years. We have um, maybe half a dozen uh, different countries. And the representation is really very simple. You know, we're just talking about bar charts and a slider that you know, moves the bar charts around a little bit. But we can at least use that as a way to start talking about this story for you know, how does this uh, spike in population move forward uh, over time. In other cases, we're looking at um, just what are different ways of actually trying to represent a set of data that we're, uh, we're interested in. So I was curious about um, you know, the Fortune 500 ranking. So uh, Fortune Magazine, going back to 1955, has this list of the top uh, 500 companies. And you know, as chosen by the, uh, the Fortune editors, um, and I was curious about just, you know, what does that look like over time in terms of uh, the way that, you know, the, the, the rise and fall of these different uh, firms. And so at the left-hand side, we have uh, 1955, these little uh, gray lines you see there are just uh, the company names done very, very tiny. And then over to uh, 2010 on the right-hand side, so 55 years of, uh, of companies times the, the 500 rows um, gives you about uh, 25,000 or so data points. And then if I just click the mouse, I can uh, drag this around and see this, you know, this rise and fall thing that happens across these companies. Um, you know, again, not, uh, not a very involved thing. This is uh, you know, sort of a sketch type of piece that's um, you know, done over the course of a couple hours. Uh, over the right-hand side, we have you know, typical uh, things that you might expect as far as you know, the largest, uh, largest 10 companies, but also you see things like Here's you know, HP and the rise of information technology um, over that 50-year uh, span. And uh, over the left, um, we have the same kind of thing happening in reverse. So uh, we have the rise of information technology in one direction, and in the other, it's the US moving away from heavy industry, uh, heavy uh, manufacturing, and so on. And so we can start telling a, a little bit of a story just based on uh, the way that you know, this is a maker of heavy farm equipment and the way that these uh, companies have played out over time. And so, um, or we get something like, here's uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, I enjoy this, but I think this is basically Warren Buffett refusing to uh, get caught up in the dot-com bubble. And everyone says, oh, you're an idiot. And it's like, nope, I'm not. Um, and off goes uh, Warren. Uh, Switching over to just looking at it by, uh, by revenue tells you uh, a very different story. Um, you know, so even with the uh, Warren Buffett story, nothing had fundamentally changed except for the opinion um, of those editors. Uh, within the profit um, side of things, we get a very, uh, a very different story. I apologize, the um, color's a little bit faded out here, but um, we can look into you know, some of these largest losses. Freddie Mac, you may have heard about, uh, bad day. Um, Fannie Mae also a bit of a rough time. Uh, so just taking you know, tens and thousands of data points, we can start uh, understanding something very, uh, very straightforward about you know, clearly there's something happening industry by industry, and also some of these outliers in terms of the uh, things that are uh, falling off in terms of the profit uh, side of things. Those uh, really very quickly start giving you an impression of what's actually happening within this, uh, this data set. Um, what we would typically do is we would then take um, that piece, you know, if we were trying to actually explain you know, what, what is the story of the, that Fortune 500 data set. So um, we would take what we found there, and uh, now knowing that it's really a, a story about uh, industries and different sectors and things like that, we would actually build the piece around uh, trying to really pull that out and make that the, you know, the base thing that we're looking at. And then the, the company information is uh, sort of a, a set of supporting material. And the, uh, the process to this is, um, you know, the way that we uh, approach our projects is really about starting from uh, a set of data and moving all the way through to having a, uh, a way that we interact with it and, and use it. And uh, a typical sort of setup is that, um, you know, on one side of the, the diagram, we have people who uh, actually get the raw data, you know, you, uh, you acquire it, you parse it, you know, parse through it, turn it into something that we can actually uh, work with. Then we have the, you know, math and statistics and data mining folks who do all this, you know, filtering and modeling and uh, mining with it. And then having done all of the, you know, real work, uh, it gets kind of thrown over to the wall to the, these graphic designers who like, you know, make a representation and then they do this 
uh, refinement thing, you know, and Edward Tufte's happy, and uh, then at the end we do this uh, interaction portion of how you actually work with it. Uh, fundamentally, you can't do this with data, you know, so we can't separate out what happens on this side, on that left-hand side, from the way that we are going to uh, visually present it, the way that we're actually going to work with it, because so much of how, uh, how we actually work with the data, how you interact with it, has an enormous influence uh, much further back in that process in terms of the way that the, uh, the data is mined, the, uh, the models that we use on it, the way that we might want to tweak the models within the interactive application. And so um, as a studio, we uh, keep all of this in-house and have people uh, working extremely closely with one another uh, for any of these projects that we address. Um, in practice, what happens is a little bit like what you saw with the Fortune 500 diagram. You know, we get, uh, we acquire a data set, we uh, parse through it, we build a really simple representation, and then we start interacting with it to kind of get a sense of uh, what's actually useful or relevant within this data set, and then kind of work backwards to say, you know, what are the, uh, what's the question, and what are interesting hypotheses that we've found just based on this even cursory look um, at that data set, and then uh, work back forward again to do something more sophisticated with it. Uh, and as I referred to this idea of you know, the way that you interact with it um, has a great deal of influence much further back. The way that you represent things is going to, um, you know, that a representation might get overloaded. And so you might uh, actually filter or mine through the data in a very different way based on uh, what you found from, you know, we can't show 1 million data points. So we need to uh, figure out a better model for pulling out, say, 10,000 or uh, 20,000. And so we'll talk uh, a little bit more about you know, different projects here and you know, how that process plays out. Uh, a slightly more involved one that we did more recently, this is um, uh, some data from uh, Nike's fuel band. So uh, Nike has these uh, fuel band devices. Um, it gets uh, minute by minute uh, activity levels for people and it counts steps and calories and things like that. Um, but the, uh, the base thing that we're interested in is you know, how can you uh, model and look at activity of uh, individuals over time? And this, uh, they've been at this for, uh, for a couple years now, so they have a really uh, amazing data set of this, uh, you know, just hundreds of millions of um, days of activity, you know, 14, 40 um, minutes per day, and just being able to see what that, uh, what that profile looks like. Um, here we have uh, about two dozen uh, days from one person, and what we, uh, what we were really struck by as we were working with Nike on this data was there's a, uh, an amazing amount of uh, places in which we're incredibly similar. And like we kind of, you know, like clockwork, do, uh, uh, you know, sort of go from meeting to meeting so we can see this, you know, slight little uh, peak at the, uh, on the hour of people, you know, during work days kind of getting up and going to the next meeting. Um, but also just how people are different. And so fundamentally what one's activity profile actually looks like, you know, relative to somebody else. Uh, and so playing off of that, we had a project where we um, just wanted to look at, you know, so what is a way of actually making an image of somebody's activity profile? Uh, and this was an idea that had been, you know, kind of moving through the office based on a, uh, a long series of work that we'd uh, been doing with them around analyzing this data. Uh, and this was just, you know, I want to make a, a poster that looks, uh, looks interesting. It goes in your wall. It is a uh, reflection of your activity over the, the course of the year. So this is designed to be about three feet wide and two feet, uh, two feet tall. And then we um, actually built all of the uh, backend systems such that uh, people could actually grab their data um, and uh, have this poster generated from it and you know, get this highly detailed picture of what, they, uh, what they're doing. So the top two thirds is all about um, uh, your uh, typical, you know, sort of a, a uh, a fingerprint almost of uh, what your activity looks like. Um, vertical, uh, the vertical direction is uh, how, how active you are. And then uh, the left-hand side is 3 a.m. and then 4 to uh, 3 a.m. The, uh, the next night. And uh, what we can see is things like, you know, so this person, this is actually our contact from Nike. Uh, she's very good about some, somewhere between 6 and 9 in the morning. She actually gets out and gets a run in and um, you know, get some activity in. And then we have some uh, more specific details down at the bottom. And one of the interesting things was uh, the uh, folks in the Nike um, training community were actually able to sit down with people and look through these numbers and talk about, you know, how people could change uh, lifestyle and behavior based on that. 
so this is one, uh, one person's. This is uh, somebody else in our studio. So this is uh, James, who um, what we're seeing is him uh, biking to work every morning. He's good about, and then we chain him to his desk. And then um, he's good about uh, you know, getting out and going and uh, picking up lunch, and then uh, you know, biking back in the evening. And then sometimes we keep him late to work on Nike projects. Um, and so, uh, you know, very different kind of image from the, from the previous one. Um, now then, let's switch over to somebody who, this is a, somebody who's a marathoner, uh, and they go, and you know, so it's just incredibly intense. And, um, you know, so somebody who goes and like enters uh, marathons and things and like actually wins them, um, sort of this uh, really intense image. And then this is mine, which is not, <laughs> not intense. Um, I'm fairly good at getting up at right around six and then shutting down right around 11. Um, and then I have a, a new daughter, so we have some um, midnight uh, wake-ups. So, uh, but we were just really struck by and really, really pleased with um, the way that we could start showing an image that, you know, really kind of had a, uh, a signature, you know, sort of look to it that actually represented, you know, that felt true to people in terms of their activity and uh, was something that they could read, but also kind of balancing, like, just, you know, it's meant to look interesting, like, it's meant to look cool on your wall, and, um, but then kind of be supported by the details. And so um, it's one of these things based on different audiences, different, uh, different contexts, you might, uh, might have different types of goals even using that same, uh, that same data. Uh, these are a few of the, uh, of the details. Um, so we can see things like uh, this person, you know, kind of crashes on Mondays that, you know, they kind of get uh, strapped to their desk and doing a lot of email answering and then uh, Saturday, for instance, is a huge uh, activity day as they you know, probably get out and um, go hiking and fun things like that. Um, and then as a, you know, uh, as a way to kind of close the loop on this, uh, we also um, tied this in so that you know, whenever somebody actually went and looked up their plot, um, they could share it via Twitter, but that, um, that image of their activity, we would grab a uh, portion of the image and actually embed that into the uh, into the tweet itself. So um, again, some additional backend work to say, let's make sure that we have these uh, images all queued up and available for um, for people so that they can actually uh, put it within their feed. And so this was really great to see, you know, just again this variation just across um, uh, across the feed as far as uh, what people's uh, activity looks like and how how different they tend to be. Um, Part of this was also this uh, issue of, you know, they had very little support in terms of how they were going to communicate this out. And so they were relying on uh, posting it online, uh, getting a word of mouth going, getting things to, uh, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter to really get the message out. And so this was an effective way to actually um, bring people in. And we were uh, really pleased to see how this actually, uh, actually played out. So switching over a little bit from, uh, you know, with some of the issues that we see um, brought to bear in the, in the Nike piece that when dealing with, uh, with data or when dealing with information, uh, information design in general, there's sort of a, a lot of talk about sort of this aesthetics versus function thing, you know, that they're kind of treated as like sort of Cain and Abel, they like hate each other. And really that um, at the very minimum, what we wanna be talking about is a sort of, you know, spectrum like, well, is this, you know, so the Nike thing is, really much more visually driven. So it's gonna be a little bit further on that uh, aesthetic side as opposed to you know, just the pure, uh, pure functional side. Um, this is a, uh, a, a genome, uh, genome browser that I built uh, a while back looking at, you know, uh, this is a dozen different uh, mammals and lining up their DNA and being able to actually uh, examine different, uh, different sections of their code and looking at how similar uh, they are. So this is built for um, an audience of scientists. They uh, have very specific questions. Uh, it's a whole you know, interactive browser that lets you look through um, many, many millions of uh, data points and actually um, understand a little bit about how these uh, you know, pockets of con uh, conservation actually pop up. And now uh, this is the exact same data, but done as a, uh, for a magazine. So this is an illustration. Um, you know, completely different audience. So in here, it's, it's appropriate to have something, it's straightforward, it needs to be very, um, uh, you know, the, the coloring that's used here is actually a specific coloring that they're, uh, they're used to, and so, you know, kind of sticking along with that. 
Um, this is just, uh, even with that same data set, being able to put this in a magazine and say, this is really fascinating work that's happening and just trying to get people's curiosity uh, going and um, get them to actually read about, uh, read about the work. And we enjoy working across this you know, sort of spectrum between, you know, like if you do uh, too much of just the uh, tool-oriented things, uh, or I've found that if I do too much of the tool-oriented work or too much of the purely aesthetic work, um, you wind up with, you know, little, uh, either side is a little bit unsatisfying. And so um, more likely we try and work uh, around that spectrum kind of depending on the, uh, the project itself. Or um, also it's code, so this was an alternate version of it just using different, uh, a different sort of configuration of how the, the code was put together. Um, instead of a spectrum, it's probably more of a, you know, a pair of axes and uh, because the, uh, you know, aesthetics and function are not really these mutually exclusive things. Um, and so you need to figure out how to, you know, where is the appropriate place to be on this, uh, on this continuum. But really, it's not aesthetics and function that we tend to um, spend the most time on. You know, that it's um, audience and context of use that are the largest ones. Um, and really that there's this, you know, kind of multidimensional strange um, space that's involved in uh, how we make decisions about, you know, what goes into final, uh, final projects. Okay. Um, so China. Uh, a little while ago, we were, or a couple years ago, uh, we were contacted by Thomson Reuters uh, and a, a group that was looking at the uh, leadership transition in China. And you know, basically there's a uh, once in a decade uh, transition that happens within the Communist Party. Um, this is what uh, brought Xi Jinping to power. And what they wanted to do is tell the story, you know, A, of that uh, transition and you know, what, that, uh, what that actually meant, but also just you know, B, this thing of what, does, uh, what do Chinese politics actually look like and how is, uh, you know, who actually runs China uh, and what are the different uh, roles and influences that um, involve, are involved in you know, shape uh, Chinese politics. And um, you know, it's really kind of this amazing thing where uh, it's the you know, fastest growing economy, it's one of the largest uh, populations in the world, and we know, you know, especially in the States, we know next to nothing about uh, how, how Chinese power works. Um, and so the, uh, the final output is a, uh, a tablet application. It's all built with uh, HTML5, so it uh, runs within a browser as well. Um, you know, the main view is this, uh, or the initial view is this China 101, which tries to uh, set up the application and talk about different uh, parts of it. You know, here's a timeline, uh, pulling out a couple different things that are, uh, you know, events that people might be familiar with, sort of meet people where they are. Uh, and then this social power and institutional power, these are the, the main crux of the actual application. So uh, within this social power view, we're trying to explain, you know, uh, the way that that power, you know, so this, these are the informal connections between people. And so it's all about family, it's about who, uh, who your parents are, it's about um, different, uh, different people with, uh, with whom you've worked over time. And then we have, uh, in the actual visualization there, it's, um, here's Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, first degree and second degree social network. Uh, switching over to the institutional power view, this is, you know, on paper what the way that things are actually structured. So more, the more hierarchic, uh, hierarchic way of looking at this data um, and understanding how party, military, and government all have uh, different kinds of roles. And so uh, within this, we have this, you know, really uh, very large org chart that starts explaining um, all of these different uh, organizations, so the Central Military Commission, uh, we can then get more details, go and get uh, a lot more background about the, uh, the CMC in particular, um, but really just trying to bring all of this information uh, together within this one, uh, one space and this one application. Um, this, uh, this view here, this is looking at the, um, uh, the change in one's career. So, uh, because there are actual administrative levels to uh, different roles within the, uh, within the party and within the government, um, we can literally plot the arc of somebody's career. And so uh, we have different ways of showing this, whether by age or by you know, the year it took place, uh, and being able to uh, compare different people. Or here we're just looking at uh, somebody's biography and that, um, a little bit of their, uh, their background. Uh, and then finally, the uh, in-depth news stories looking at um, actual you know, longer features, 
uh, whether investigative works or just simply uh, being able to uh, name, uh, you know, learning about the, the different leaders who um, uh, were taking over uh, and sort of cross-linking that back into the, uh, the rest of the application. So that's, um, it's free and online. It's just uh, connectedchina.reuters.com. Um, and what the, uh, you know, behind this is, uh, it's about a million and a half words of text. It's uh, tens of thousands of different uh, entities, you know, so different individuals and uh, the connections between them. And uh, what, we're, you know, what we need to be able to do is take all of that information and turn, turn it back into something that doesn't feel like just this, um, this mess of connections. And so um, this was the very, uh, very first diagram that uh, Mark, one of the developers, put together of just, just that social network data. So this is uh, just a, you know, a few thousand edges, a few, um, a few hundred nodes. This is a tiny fraction of what would go into the final piece. Um, this is fairly typical of what you see with a lot of visualization. People kind of build this, uh, this image and you know, it's like, wow, that's so complex. It's like, yeah, I know my data, it's so complex. I'm, you know, it's really important. Um, but we never want to put this in front of people. You know, that this is you know, somewhat nonsensical. Um, and it's just, it doesn't actually give you any insight about what's actually happening within this network. It was a really helpful uh, look for us as far as you know, how long does it take to get from point A to point B? And can I, how many steps will it require to get from this person to this next person? Um, so we'll start with something like that. Again, this, you know, as we work through the process, this is an initial sketch. Um, and then a, a little further down the line, this is uh, now with you know, one of the designers um, starting to map out, you know, like let's put a little bit more structure on it. And uh, we're starting to you know, set up different levels. So instead of just having this um, sea of information, how can we start putting a little bit more hierarchy around it and figuring out what we want to uh, include more of or you know, other things that we might leave out or uh, be able to put prior a little bit more priority on that. And so here's the... Um, same data set uh, in another interactive application, but um, heading toward you know, what we, we would have in the final, which is uh, this particular view. And uh, there are a number of lines sort of, you know, the, the lines are maintained, but we're really talking about, uh, or we're really focusing on this, you know, this first degree and this uh, second degree of, of connections with, uh, within it. So uh, this was you know, fascinating too, as far as just, it's, uh, it's an incredible resource in the end, but um, for us, uh, one of the things we really enjoy is uh, really being able to immerse ourselves within a particular domain of the, uh, the project that we might be uh, working on. So in this case, we got to uh, spend a great deal of time um, getting the uh, domain background of, uh, around China and working with other domain experts. Um, and then that's brought to bear in the final uh, application. Uh, and then it's, you know, that's fundamentally a totally different kind of thing from, say, the, the movement data that we just saw before it. Um, and then to finish up, what I would like to do is just show a pair of projects. One of the um, other things that we do within the, uh, the studio is we try and take, uh, you know, go after things that we're curious about. So uh, in my case, it was the, you know, the Fortune 500 piece, and we'll build these, uh, these smaller projects that, you know, kind of work out different ideas within data sets that we're interested in. Um, and this was, you know, it kind of goes back to what uh, originally got me interested in doing in design in the first place because it's a way of kind of approaching uh, all manner of things that you're uh, curious about. Uh, but it also has a, you know, a practical purpose in terms of how we, um, uh, the things that we work out in these sort of smaller projects uh, teach us a great deal about um, some of the, the larger works. Um, so this, uh, and so typically what happens with uh, these projects is it starts out with something small and then kind of, um, you know, with one person leading it. So this was uh, Mark from our studio who, uh, you know, was really interested in uh, looking at Miles Davis and the hundreds of people that he's uh, performed with over time. Um, so we have this, you know, constellation of people. And then over time, Mark kind of pulling other people into, you know, another designer and another developer and so on um, into these things that kind of turn into a bit of a boondoggle. Um, so with this, we have this uh, constellation up top of um, hundreds of dots, one for each of the uh, people that uh, Miles played with on any of the uh, sessions or rec uh, recordings that, with which he was involved. Uh, and then a timeline in the middle here that um, shows where, you know, uh, where in time that actually happened. So uh, left to right, we have uh, 
time passing up at the top, we have you know, roughly the, the midpoint of when that person worked uh, and, or was playing with Miles. Um, you know, so here I select uh, Herbie Hancock, and I can just scrub through all of the uh, sessions that he was on with him. Uh, or I can, oops, excuse me. Uh, up at the top, let's see if there's anyone named John who worked with him. Um, you know, so we'll select out and we can find a particular person and you know, start uh, seeing some of these people. And then uh, also tying that back to the, uh, the actual audio clips. So Mark did the work to wire this into the, uh, the iTunes store so you can actually hear all of these different things. So as you're just uh, moving through this whole space of uh, information, also being able to kind of hear uh, some of what this sounded like and just the, uh, the change over time and then the incredible uh, variety in terms of um, his work and what uh, the, uh, the way that those, perform those various performers actually influence the, uh, the final sound of things. Um, another project was uh, uh, started by uh, James in our studio where he was, um, he was curious about the movie Rocky. Um, and actually in particular the uh, several different Rocky movies that have uh, happened over the, uh, the many year span of uh, the first five or six Rockies. And uh, you know, basically, could you take uh, take the film and uh, just line it up? You know, that it's like, oh, it's just this. You know, like you you start out and something bad happens, and then there's like a, a fight, and then there's like a montage, and then um, you know, can we actually take this you know prescriptive kind of plot and just map that out? And so this was the first sketch, just looking at you know, just all of the. Uh, this is one frame per. Uh, per minute and seeing if we can kind of line up what's happening in terms of the storyline. It turns out um, it was slightly less uh, prescriptive. You know, Rocky movies are way more sophisticated than we thought. <laughs> um, and so going with that, um, this, was the, uh, this was the final piece he built out. So here's uh, each of the Rocky, uh, Rocky movies, uh, time going left to right. Um, and uh, with each of these bars colored by uh, what type of uh, what type of scene we're actually looking at? So, uh, training is here in blue, uh, montage is in yellow, uh, pre-fight is orange, fight is in red, um, and then <laughs> dialogue boring. Um, <laughs> and you know, so this very uh, you know very quick interactive app that lets you um, just you know scrub through all this video. So one of the um, a lot of times on projects like this, we're tr also trying to figure out a uh, you know, some technical uh, piece as well. So here we wanted to be able to say, like, if we've got, you know, uh, eight, 10 hours of video, how can we really quickly scrub through that without um, actually having to deal with uh, players or components or anything like that and have it be, have it be efficient? Um, also, we can do things like, you know, just show me, uh, here's the training version of uh, each of the films. Uh, and, it, the amount of, you know, the relative amount of time. Here's pre-fight, you know, fight. Fight actually stays fairly even throughout. Um, montage is kind of like where everybody wants to go. Um, and here, Rocky IV, just like, I just want to see the Rocky IV with just nothing but montage. Um, and so, uh, yeah, dialogue, nah. Um, so here, just taking, you know, very simple idea, being able to, um, you know, break, uh, break this down. One of the things that, um, James was interested in this, you know, was just this idea of, uh, from uh, Vladimir Prop of, you know, how do you, how can you actually tag, uh, tag story and, um, you know, put I ideas behind it. It's extremely high-minded and very academic kind of stuff. Um, but the kind of amazing thing that happened on this too is just that um, a lot of people, it turns out, really like care a lot about Rocky um, and have a lot of opinions about it, but we would get feedback like this. So finally, some scientific proof why Rocky IV is the best. <laughs> Shortest runtime, three montages. So um, the internet has, uh, has spoken. So thanks very much. So one of the things that strikes me um, as hard to explain, but really clear when you talk about it, is the, the real integration end-to-end -end from the raw data to the experience mm -hmm. to understand and um, really interact with the data. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you, if you were to um, 
you know, I think in, in large companies, people like to have different groups doing different things. And wh what's your sort of most uh, salient point to explain why that needs to be an end-to-end -to -end integrated experience or process? So, let's see. Um, well, I think you can, you can see a bit of it in terms of how, uh, how a number of the projects actually play out. You know, so I think the Nike, for instance, the Nike poster isn't very interesting if we say, you know, on one side people did some analysis and then they kind of gave us these averaged out versions of what those plots look like and then, you know, we kind of made images of what average, uh, average plots look like. Um, with the, um, or if there's a, a technical side of uh, just how we, um, you know, with the, the Fortune 500 data, um, the way that we typically think about information like that, it's, um, and actually I think Fortune has a, a version of this kind of up, up on their site where it's, oh, we're gonna you know, look at these companies and here's the list of the first 100 and then you hit the next button and go to the you know, 100 to 200 and uh, if I click one company then maybe it gives me a cross reference of, hopefully nobody's here like from Fortune Magazine, I'm not like, picking on Fortune, but um, uh, looking at one company and you see the, you know, the rank uh, and the breakdown of you know, where they might show up, but it's kind of, you know, uh, it's driven by, hey, we're going to hit a database and then it's going to come back and uh, give us some sort of result and we're going to put that on screen and uh, have the designers pick the right font so that it's laid out nicely and, uh, you know, then, and, you know, everything else that kind of comes along with that. And so just how do we, um, you know, try and collapse enough of those steps so that we're really trying to do something that's more, or we're able to do something that's more focused and more driven by how are people actually going to use the data? and the, um, and hopefully that that is uh, far more efficient in terms of how the, the, uh, the way that the data can be put together, I think. So one just quick follow on, part of the, the sort of interesting thing with big data in my mind is that there is some new ways of thinking about it beyond just doing linear regression and statistics. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you would probably put together, I guess, a cross-functional team of someone mm -hmm. who's doing more exotic algorithms Yeah, or so we'd, uh, we would have a, a, a team, you know, so a lot of the work that we do kind of on the, on the left-hand side of that process diagram is really about understanding the, the shape of the data. And so we'd have, a, um, we'd have different people who, you know, so if we, it needs to be more analysis heavy, um, if we have more exo exotic algorithm work happening, um, that we actually have those people involved, uh, but with the designers so that we know, like, well, what are the parameters of the algorithm that we might actually want to play with um, you know, further down the road as far as uh, not just getting back, uh, you know, and, and not just getting back, say, the, the final clustered results or not getting back a bunch of averages of averages or something like that. And so, um, and as uh, for people who have, you know, done a lot of uh, stats or big data work, that there are uh, dozens or even, you know, hundreds of assumptions that go into any sort of work in terms of how you model or, um, you know, confidence intervals or different uh, ranges that are actually uh, used in terms of parameters for, you know, filtering and mining through the data. And uh, if you do this sort of black box version of the way that the analysis works, that gets, uh, that gets hidden. And instead, a lot of times, it's much more effective to be able to surface some of those, uh, some of those knobs so that people can actually test those assumptions and say, is this algorithm actually working for me? Or is it um, have we actually just tuned it to the point where it gives us a, a good answer for a particular data set and then uh, kind of falls apart elsewhere? Okay, and, and I wanted to ask you one more question before I open it up. It's something we talked about earlier. Um, you, you described a spectrum of work you guys do, and I'd like you to sort of walk the audience through it all the way from a very targeted, um, you know, quote unquote simple mm -hmm. output to something more transformational like the work you showed. Could you walk us through sort of what the extremes look like from your view? Yeah, so I, I think um, even in terms of a, approach, one of the things that we, we tend to advocate is uh, doing that simplest version first of just, uh, you know, given this particular data set, let's actually try and uh, take a look at it to see what, um, see if it actually says the types of things that you think it does. And, so, and understand a little bit about what the actual level of quality is within the data, that um, one of the things that tends to be missed is, uh, or people tend to over, overstate, uh, or you know, people tend to think too highly of their data and unless they, until they start really looking at it. Um, and, the, uh, and also understanding just how clean the data is or what, uh, what might be anomalous or what might be 
uh, you know, things that just pop out as outliers because of uh, some error in terms of how the data was collected. And so we like to do some of these very simple uh, pragmatic things first to just you know, uh, test out some of those assumptions. Uh, maybe we're even uh, using a representation that um, is the, uh, the same as what was used before. Um, but just trying to you know, fix some of the design aspects of it, trying to just fix some layout things. You know, can it be the best possible within that type of format? Uh, and then that teaches us enough to say, and now let's you know, completely throw that out. And what you're really trying to do is actually over here. And so there's a really different way of actually looking at, uh, looking at the data that's more transformational, more, uh, more targeted to a particular audience. Or you might be able to identify an audience having done that initial work that you might not have you know, thought of before. And so there are other ways that you might uh, approach it at that point. Cool. Great. Great presentation. Uh, Dennis you. Ringland with Rapid Minor. I've got two questions. One. Uh, as you uh, look at the development of this, could you talk a little bit about the type of coding that goes into preparing this? Mm -hmm. And the second part of my question would be, uh, when we talk about data mining in sort of the scientific world, in the business world, a lot of the data cleansing in the upfront takes that 60 to 80 percent of the time. Yep. I would have to imagine in this type of representations that you're creating, you've got to be putting an awful lot of time into the back end for the final result. So you may have a 50-50 split. Can you just talk a little bit about that? So uh, actually, so I'll start with that one. That the, um, so that can certainly be the case. One of the things that we're actually trying to do with visualization is often that before you even in, invest that full 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the time, trying to take a, even a messy version of it and making sure that it's even worth cleaning up, you know, like have you even collected the correct stuff in the first place? Um, I, uh, my postdoctoral work was in uh, genetics, and one of the things that um, we often ran into was uh, it's the iterative process of let's look at this data set, let's uh, build something, let's actually represent it, and uh, the actual that whole refinement process and cleaning things up and et cetera. Um, it was often more useful to get just that initial uh, look at things to see where we were going next and throw that out and uh, move on to the next step. So there's a lot of that that happens uh, along the way as well. Um, and the, in terms of the, uh, you know, if there are projects where it's uh, more data cleaning heavy and things like that, um, that simply varies based on the project. And it's just, it's the, you know, back to this thing of uh, audience and context, you know, that what's the, what's the right level of uh, how, how long we, you know, go and clean that information before uh, putting it into the final thing. You know, like the, uh, in something like the, the Nike project, um, actually going through and pulling out every last outlier uh, isn't actually a great, uh, great approach because people already have some sense of their own data. And they're able to kind of um, look at that and kind of filter out the outliers. It was like, oh yeah, there was that, um, that day that it would just you know, kind of uh, blew the doors off, or this other day that, um, yeah, my uh, device was like misbehaving a little bit, and so you know, they can kind of tune that out. Versus us going through and trying to do a really sophisticated analysis and remove every last uh, detail that might be something that they'd be like, well, what, what about this other you know, kind of anomalous thing that wound up getting caught in that, uh, in that dragnet of uh, cleaning? Um, another thing that we often run into is when, uh, when engaging with, uh, with clients or working with different people who um, uh, are kind of the, uh, you know, those who, uh, what's the term for people who like sit on the data, like the monks who like, you know, or, um, have all this data within organizations. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, one of the things that we're often trying to do is make sure that we get a a version that's not been completely, um, you know, had all of its personality removed because too, so many assumptions go into that that uh, we might wind up with um, really, you know, uh, really boring information kind of out the other end. And so uh, we're often kind of trying to push on that a little bit as far as how we might play with some of those assumptions. Cool. Oh, in tools, um, so we have, uh, depending on different parts of the process, we'll, we'll use different sets of tools. And uh, different people have their own, uh, their own sorts of approaches. So uh, for instance, um, the, uh, the Nike data, we have a um, set of uh, Java and um, uh, processing-based tools. So processing is another sort of um, 
part, uh, part of what I work on that it's this uh, programming environment for doing visual things and um, tries to make it easier to uh, build, uh, build visual things with code. And um, so we'll do, and that's uh, primarily based on Java. Uh, so we have some you know, heavy number crunching things that we do there so we can process um, several billion data points within about uh, four minutes to try and get a picture of what the entire expanse of that uh, Nike data set looks like, you know, so the whole two years of uh, all of their customers. Um, because we want to be able to ask you know, questions of it really quickly. Um, and uh, so we'll do that, or uh, we'll do you know, Python scripts to just try and uh, munch through things a little bit. Uh, on the server side, we'll do, uh, we're very uh, Python heavy, and then uh, sometimes doing some, uh, some, starting to do a little bit of JavaScript work. Um, there's sort of a, an inflection point uh, of when we might start with uh, Java or when we might start with JavaScript, kind of which is which tends to hinge on how much data is actually involved and how much we want to, you know, within JavaScript, we don't want to deal with hundreds of megabytes of data. For Java, it's no sweat. And so um, just what that, you know, at the beginning of a project, we're kind of making a decision about uh, which battles we want to fight in terms of how much data goes in or uh, do we want to be closer to what the front end thing is going to be looking like uh, in the end. So. Hi, uh, I, I guess I have the mic. Uh, my name is Ron. Uh, it's uh, really nice to hear a talk. I hear a talk three years ago on RISD campus. Uh, thank you. Cool. Um, my question is uh, mostly about uh, stories. I, I'm curious about when you do the design, where does the story come from? The, in the case of the, the China uh, and the, the example, I think the data itself in the beginning didn't tell you too much of a story. And then I, I, we see the map and then it's starting to tell a story. And I guess it's coming from the designer or uh, the, uh, the people who is in the project, mm -hmm. uh, so in a way from the human side. Yep. And, and so what are the cases where the story coming from mostly from the human, from the user research, and what are the uh, cases that the story comes mostly from the data itself? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the, um, so in the case of, say, the China project, that we're looking at something where uh, we'd like people to, uh, like it's, because it's for a more general audience, the tool winds up being a bit more general and not as story driven as we might uh, we might want, um, or not because it's a, a general news audience. Um, you know, so uh, that the target is going to be people who are interested in uh, China, who are you know going to read. At its most basic, it's you know who's going to read a, a Reuters article about China, and that's the base audience, and that's everything from China watchers to academics to um, people who are just trying to understand a little bit about China. Um, now, with the, that particular project, uh, for me to go back and um, you know, do that project again or to uh, take that further, what I would actually really like, or um, as a firm, what we would like to do is uh, be able to focus that even more on particular audiences. You know, so uh, for a general audience who knows very little about, about China, um, we could tell a much, more, uh, a much sharper story just about the leadership transition aspect of it or just about you know, how uh, the soft connections of, uh, be, you know, between people in terms of these social connections. And uh, you know, usually what we're trying to do is figure out how, how specific we can make that audience. And so then the, all the design decisions kind of fall out of that in terms of, you know, so here's something that's more general. Uh, it needs to be able to uh, be used by a, a whole range of people. But also with, uh, you know, as other examples for the China project, it's, you can imagine if the, audi uh, the primary audience were China, um, that takes on a, a very different look as well. And even the, the way in which it's delivered. So we would probably actually want to be delivering it via mobile phone, uh, which also has completely different, uh, you know, so it's this context issue. Um, and so it's going to be in Chinese, it's going to be delivered by mobile phone. We can dispense with all of this background about you know, the, the basics of how uh, Chinese politics work. And it's really going to be driven by things that um, you know, the, the, inflect, the um, uh, end points are going to be things around what people are familiar with or what's actually happening uh, in particular, say, locally. You know, so we might use some of these locations, start with a province, and then move up to some of these larger, um, you know, national uh, sorts of issues. Instead, at the uh, outside looking in, it's going to be this, you know, national focus, and then later we can actually get into those provincial things, but, um, you know, that, that changes fundamentally. And so, you know, kind of this point of, the things that we really spend a lot of time thinking about or trying to address, 
are really those issues of, of audience because of uh, you know, the, uh, the audience and who's going to be using it, and then that context of use around you know, is it on a, on a mobile phone? Why did somebody just pull, out the, pull their mobile phone out of their pocket to look at this thing? And what are they you know, expecting to be able to do at that, at that point? And um, from that, all of the, those other design decisions kind of fall out of that. Uh, yeah, want to go here and then over here? Hi, um, thanks very much, great presentation. Um, when you design a new visualization, I obviously understand you've got tons of experience, uh, tons of expertise, but are there any, uh, any more objective quantitative rules that say if this is a data set, given sparsity, given range values, uh, uh, given you know, numeric versus uh, textual mm -hmm. data, this is probably the best visualization, this is your second choice, this is your mm -hmm. third choice. Is there anything that uh, uh, more of an average kind of a common business yeah. analyst who sure. doesn't have the luxury of experimenting yeah. with data uh, can you know immediately put into uh, into work into action? Yeah, I I don't have a good uh, short answer for that. I think it's kind of a um, I think there are you know books that talk about kind of trying to break down some of the well it's you know here it's more useful to do a bar chart and here it's more useful to do a um, different types of uh, different types of representations or, or ways of uh, ways of interacting with it. Um, but I, I don't have a good short answer on it. I guess. So uh, within your firm, you span you know, everything from the data analysis all the way to design. But within individuals, are you looking for, you know, will your designers necessarily be more quantitative or data driven than the average designers, or do you just want to get the best designer you can and train them? So we, um, yeah, only, only the best. Yeah, um, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really lucky that we, we've, uh, we have this amazing group of people who um, we've been able to, uh, to put together, and so like I, uh, you know, so I'm showing all of their work as far, you know, so uh, let that be known. But um, within, you know, person to person, uh, we don't tend to take people who, let's see, I guess the, the simplest answer is that we usually get people that are somewhere on a continuum, for, you know, so if, if we took folks in the office uh, and if the axes were, or the, the points were um, design and development, we could kind of you know, put people on the spectrum from, we have one person who's 90% you know, uh, design and 10% code, and another person who's 90% code and then 10% uh, design. And, um, and then different you know, people fall on there in terms of how, how much they want to get into the code. Um, everybody needs to have some percentage of, uh, of that and at least enough interest in it to understand kind of how things are being structured. You know, we don't, um, it's not so much we want everybody to do everything and everyone to be you know, unicorns and uh, things like that. Um, and even within a, a project, you know, so uh, I had a split background between uh, graphic design and computer science. Um, even for me, it's difficult to, on the same project, do both the design and development side of it because uh, often the development side gets, uh, or I'm sorry, the design might be too influenced by what I know from the, the data. And so it's useful to have um, somebody else kind of you know pushing the, uh, pushing back at you as far as like um, sort of uh, taking away some of your assumptions and you know things you might be missing. Um, that being said, within the uh, the people who are who are there, we also have folks who do uh, much more writing, uh, who do cartography, who do analysis work, um, and so they have different you know different kinds of roles. And typically, when we're trying to hire, we're looking for people who um, have a couple of different. Uh, a few different interests that they um, that they've actually been working on. You know, so we have one person who uh, did a ton of uh, cartography work during during undergrad. We have we hired her essentially. You know, like one day she does uh, some writing, next day she does some GIS work, um, next day she does some project management, um, and she you know can kind of move between these things. But you know, she also has a background in doing public radio work, and so that that winds up being really helpful in terms of how we. Uh, frame and communicate and talk about work and how you put you know how you put a story together. Um, for other people, one of our uh, you know so our lead designer on the China project, um, her undergrad degree you know she had a uh, she got a design degree from uh, RISD, but her undergraduate was actually in business, and so you know she's uh, had various different roles you know over the course of uh, her career that all wind up you know sort of um, you know playing into what the the final picture looks like.
Mike Cicino, Visible Systems Corporation. Nice presentation. I have a question on the revenue model. Uh, can you get into any of the aspects of the revenue model? Or? And for, the, for the firm? Uh, no, for each one of the projects. Oh, for perhaps? the projects. Yes. Uh, depends on the project. So the, um, let's see. It's interesting. So the two large ones, so Nike and China, are not revenue driven. Um, so it de depends on the project. You know, so the, uh, in the case of the, uh, the China project, it's a, you know, fundamentally it's, uh, it's news. Um, the Reuters part of Thomson Reuters is, um, at least at the, at the time, was a, uh, treated it as its own thing, not so much a uh, PNL. And so like basically it's the, the straightforward news function of it. On the uh, Nike project, that's a uh, more oriented toward uh, community and the communication side of things. So how they get the community actually involved in understanding and looking at, uh, looking at their data and in particular motivating them to be more active. And so there's a, uh, the person uh, who we're most connected with, uh, who, who we are connected with there, um, her role is really trying to um, uh, use the you know things that they understand from the data and be able to um, get the community more engaged because what they find is that um, people will be more active the more uh, uh, the more they get uh, you know the more friends they have the more you know they're within the ecosystem things like that and so um, that uh, engagement bit is is uh, important for them. Cool. So uh, I know this. Probably lots more questions, but we're going to try to wrap up to stay a little bit around time. Thank you so much for joining us, and please join me in thanking Ben. Thanks.